Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, pause this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here. Waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. In the context of this podcast, everybody refers to us and our cat. You are free to feel however you want about Rand, who is a fictional character. Don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Okay, well, let's get this over with. <laughs> hey, here's some good news. Look at this cute Rockley wallpaper that I found oh, today. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> He's so cute. Oh, I love Rockley. I know. Who doesn't? Absolute fucking unit. It's just one of the one of the best anime characters of all time. God, true. I know I've told you this, but I'll say it for podcast posterity. I would always, before I watched Nerd, I would always see like, Rockley cosplay and I'd be like I just don't get it like this kid yeah. is the ugliest motherfucker I've ever seen in my life why would you willingly want to look like him and I'm like damn I will wear a green jumpsuit every day for the rest of my life Snip because your I hair in a bowl cut. love this boy so much <laughs> he's a great 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 character Nart really went off with a few of its characters yeah a few of it it didn't Sasuke. <laughs> they were like, well, this will work, I yeah, guess. Yeah, fuck him. But, uh, yeah, Rock Lee. Mike Guy. Mike Guy! Kagashi. Oh, what an icon. Okay, we could keep talking about oh, no, Naruto sorry. for the runtime of this podcast. Don't tempt me. But this is, in fact, Everybody Hates Rand. It's a Wheel of Time podcast. Um, we just don't want to talk about the chapters today. Yeah. I'm Emily Jushaw. And I'm Sally Gutcher. Um... Okay, let's just let's just put this right out there. We're going to talk pretty briefly about the chapters, but uh, as we have discussed amongst ourselves, we don't have much productive to say that we haven't said already. Yeah. Uh, so I'll do a little summary. Um, anything we feel like saying during the <laughs> during the, <laughs> the time, we'll say. Um, then we'll, Sally has some notes about domestic and intimate partner violence. Correct. So we'll just have a little PSA. Yep. A, a really relevant little PSA. Um, and then if we are, are, and then if we just have so much more time, we'll just keep talking about Naruto. <laughs> just keep talking about Naruto. I have so many thoughts. Um, but to start us off. Trigger warning, content warning, the chapters we read deal directly with sexual assault and rape. Um, if that's going to be a problem for you, it's a problem for everyone, yeah. I imagine. But if that is a particular um, trigger for you, then uh, take breaks if you need to, or feel free to skip this episode. It yeah. will probably mostly be Naruto related. Yeah. And I really doubt you'll miss anything. Yeah. Um, but these are two chapters, both from Matt's point of view, except for a very, very brief Rian point of view at the end of for the second like, chapter. For, like, fucking reason, yeah, Robert Jordan. Two paragraphs. So stupid. I, I hate when he does this. Um, they deal with Matt moving into the Terrace and Palace with all of his guys. Um, he gets a really nice set of rooms, which he is excited by, except that he is the entire time very nervous because the dice stopped rolling in his head. He's mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, what the, what the fuck could happen? Um, the first day he's there, he is like touring his rooms and Tylan corners him uh, in his rooms and uh, assaults him. Um, but is interrupted by Tom and Julian coming to talk to Matt. Uh, so she leaves and they talk about Elaine and Nynaeve who haven't come back yet. Yeah. Elaine and Nynaeve are at this point uh, with the kin mm -hmm. or on their way back. Tom and Julian reveal to Matt what they have just discovered themselves that Nynaeve and Elaine can make disguises using the one power and everyone is like, oh, well, that sure explains a fucking lot. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. 
Uh, but Nynaeve and Elaine eventually do get back and to Matt's surprise are pretty gung-ho now about the idea of bodyguards since they have just spent most of their morning being dragged, dragged from place around. to place and uh, almost kidnapped slash killed at yeah. the end. Like had bricks thrown at them or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Matt's like, okay, well, okay, great. Here, have some bodyguards. Uh, the party then does not go to the Rahad directly, which is what Matt is expecting. Yeah. Um, and I and even Elaine are deciding to pursue the kin angle, apparently. Yeah. Um, we don't really get their full reasoning behind this. Not that we really need it. I'm, I'm sick of hearing Elaine and I need <laughs> quote unquote reasoning. Uh, yeah. Reasoning in the loosest possible terms. Like why would you suddenly start chasing these random group of women when your magic dream told you it was in the ray head? Yeah. What? Uh, why not? <laughs> They're like, we'll just, uh, these ladies we're hoping will eventually lead us to the bowl of the winds. And it's like, you just worked up the, the gumption to talk to Matt about wandering into the bolt into the yeah. rehab to look for it i guess i guess matt hasn't sat them down and been like okay here's how it works for me yeah the most the most random thing ever so i literally could just walk into the rehab choose some random streets and probably show up there yeah you know we the readers can assume that would be pretty effective yeah but nine and elaine are pursuing the kin angle so they're having matt uh watch the house. They don't really tell him why he's watching the house. That's just what he's doing. Um, and they seem to be sort of uh, mostly watching Keridin yeah. in their disguises. Uh, but it's mostly the two of them and their bodyguards and Avienda and Matt gets paired up with uh, Matt is hanging out mostly with Nalashan and then Burjeet joins them. Burjeet and Matt's burgeoning friendship is sort of the high points of these chapters. Um, and it itself is framed in the men are from Mars, women are from Venus, gender dynamics of Robert Jordan being like, in Matt's world, men and women can't be friends. Yeah. Matt says, oh, I have friends who are women, but we are, we are so different and we view the world different, differently. And the way Burgi is, Burgi is just like one of the guys, you know, which... This is pretty boring gender dynamics, um, obviously, but about as much as we can expect from this series at yeah. this point. And, like, it's just so goddamn refreshing to have Burgie and Matt, two characters who aren't horrible to each other, yeah. hanging out. That it's like, whatever, I will wade through the dumb gender politics. <laughs> yeah. To get to Matt and Burgie hanging out. Yeah. No, it's... If that's what it takes. That's such a good way to put it. It's like, at this point, I'm so exhausted by the gender dynamics that I'm just like, this is such sexist bullshit, but I just, like, would love to just have Burgie and Matt having a nice conversation. Yeah. All they do is just chill. They're just chilling. Matt's just like, Burgie, it's two bros. so funny because... She points out women for me to look at, and she expects me to point out men <laughs> she should look at, which is easy, because it's just the <laughs> ugliest man I can find, yeah. and that's what she finds interesting. I love her so much. She's hilarious. Um, uh, so he's hanging out with Brigitte um, and Nalashan sort of by day, just sort of these miserable hours-long vigils just outside this gross in yeah like the food is nasty the drinks are nasty yeah now LaShawn's like or someone is drinking lemonade julian is i yeah. think and matt's like i'm not fucking drinking lemon. <laughs> yeah. i've i've tasted yeah. a lemon that's disgusting yeah julian's like it's refreshing and he's like nah dog not for me it's like eh. he references taking a bite out of a lemon which is so funny matt would take a bite out of a lemon because it's like i feel like i get it like if you weren't familiar with lemons yeah, you'd be like... You'd be like, oh, it's a fruit. It's, what do you do yeah. with a fruit? You chomp it. Or it looks like an orange, you peel it, and you just take a bite out of it, right? Oranges right. are nice. Surprise. Lemons are not nice. Unless you're my niece, Zoe, who loves sucking on lemons. Okay, Zoe. We know. What a freak. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking bizarre. <laughs> what the hell? I know. So weird. She, like, cries when you take them away from her. Oh, my like, God. 
<laughs> little alien baby. <laughs> so troubling, you know? Fucking weirdo. Um, boy, I'm gonna have trouble getting over it. <laughs> I know. It's uh, so weird. So that's Matt's daytime activity. He does have, have some pretty funny lines about how he's like, I'm just here, apparently, to do Tavirin stuff. I don't know how to how being yeah. Tavirin works. I'm gonna go see if being Tavirin works over in that alley. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. I don't know anything. Yeah. And now, at one point, now Sean's like, I guess I'll just walk down this alley? What are we doing? And Matt's, and Matt's like, like, I don't know, man. I don't know now, Sean. The fuck if I know. What are, what are we doing? Just <laughs> <laughs> to say. Um... Matt, after that first time being cornered by Tylan in his rooms, the next night he, like, locks her out, but hears her outside very creepily. Oh, and he, like, comes back to a note inviting him to dinner with her, which he wisely does not attend. Attend. He's just like, okay. Uh, But he has, like, a little room in his vast chambers that he's like, I'll move Oliver into these rooms. And then, you know, that is a sort of measure of protection for myself um he does that tylen off screen i guess sort of uh recruits the entire staff of the terrison palace in on this um including the kitchen so they won't feed matt because they're like you have to go to dinner with the queen so matt like gets around this by eating during the day and yeah. picking up like 7-eleven food on the way home yeah um, but he is obviously being coerced into potentially attending a dinner with the queen that will turn into a sexual assault. Yep. Eventually on the day of the Festival of Birds, which is our second festival after Swoven Nights. That was our last one when mm-hmm. Bergie and Matt and Beslin all got drunk together. Yeah, which is like, I think canonically like a day and a half ago. <laughs> like three days ago, I think. <laughs> So, so just festivals all the time. Yeah, it's, so, it's very confusing. Yeah. Um, this is the Festival of Birds. We find out a little bit more about it. People dress up as birds. There are these things sort of like parade floats moving yeah. through the cities. They're called settings. And according to Beslin, they're normally indoors. But because of the hot weather right now, everything's sort of moving outside. Mm-hmm. Um, it's as usual with all of the festivals we've seen in this world, an excuse for people to dress up and be slutty and go yeah. crazy, yeah. which is all fine under normal circumstances. Uh, but Max, Ma- Max, Matt wakes up that day with the dice rolling in his head again, and he's so freaked out by that that um, he doesn't even notice when Tylan enters his room, bundles Oliver off. Um, he attempts to leave by getting the key from her, and she holds him at knife point and backs him up into his bedroom, uh, and rapes him. Uh, of course, Robert Jordan skims over the rape itself. You have to be PG-13 here, folks. So we just pick up an indeterminate amount of time later. Yeah. With everyone getting dressed again. Um... Matt, Tylen leaves. Matt uh, also leaves to go to his normal daily stuff, this time in festival time. Um, he meets up with Bergie and Nalashan. Bergie is dressed scantily in a fun bird outfit. Yeah. Matt's like, what the? This doesn't seem <laughs> you like wear you. dresses. <laughs> She's like, I like people to look at me. And he's like, okay. Okay. 10-4. Accepted. Uh, Beslin then joins them. I hate this guy. For some reason. I guess he's like, Matt and I have to hang out every festival day. Matt's like, I'd rather we didn't, though. I'd rather you fucked off. I'd rather you left. Yeah. Beslin's like, you're Tavir and it'll be fun. Matt's like, I assure you, today will not be fun. We're sitting on a bench all day. All day. And Beslin's like, no, it'll be fun. Unfortunately, they do get attacked by a random group of beggars who we can 
<laughs> we can figure out are connected to the swarm of beggars in this city who are under Old Cully's command. Yeah, like what? <laughs> old Cully's like a figure in the shadows with the marionette strings. Moving strings. all of the beggars around. Um, Beslin's like, these aren't real beggars, though. These are just people dressed up as beggars. Yeah, he's like, they don't have the special pinky ring that the marks guild. them as belonging to the <laughs> guild of beggars. And that's like, holy fucking shit. You have what to belong to a city? guild in order Everyone to in beg city. for money. Um, it's a good little action sequence. They're getting yeah. attacked. Matt and Bergie are, like, fighting back to back. It's very cool. Matt talks about how later when they're out of danger, Bergie is just like, thanks. And he's like, yeah, thank you. And it's just like... They're like Moving along. Gentleman's handshake. Yeah. <laughs> they, like, <laughs> tap each other's cups. Yeah. We survived. Yay. Doop-a-doo. They're very cute. Uh, but they return to their stakeout, uh, at which point Beslin reveals to Matt that he knows um, that Tylen is, in Beslin's worldview, seducing Matt. Yeah. That she has made Matt her, quote-unquote, pretty, or in layman's terms, I guess, her consort. Yeah. Um, Matt gets so freaked out that he gets up and immediately follows the first woman who leaves the, um, house, which he's done before to no avail, but then we switch over to Rian's point of view and, um, sort of find out that this one might actually lead somewhere. It's yeah. implied. Rian, in her point of view, is like, it's so weird for the last few days I've just been dying to do this one thing and I just haven't. <gasps> but now I'm finally doing it. So Matt's Taviran influence has been working all along. Just, just has taken this long. Yeah, not in a normal way. <clears throat> um, here's what I have to say about it. Uh, the whole thing is framed comedically. These chapters are very funny because they're Matt's point of view. Matt himself is a very comedic character. Yeah. So the sexual assault is bracketed by these very funny sequences. Um, it leads to, if you're not a white guy writing it in the 90s, I guess, a really unsettling sort of cognitive dissonance. Yes. Um, Matt reacts to the whole thing with what is his typical trauma response, which is that he does not, um, in his inner monologue, talk about what he's feeling or why he's feeling that way. It is all coming through in his physical actions. Um, and this will continue in his time with Tylen. He talks about feeling weepy. He is hypervigilant. He's very scared. He wraps, like, a sheet around himself because he's just, like, freaked out that someone is going to jump at him. Yeah. So clearly he feels very violated and yeah. very upset, even if he doesn't tell us that. Yes. So... It's interesting that Robert Jordan is able to write that trauma response with the typical clarity with which he writes Matt's trauma response, and yet not frame the scene at all as traumatic. Yeah. Again, cognitive dissonance here. Um, the whole thing is framed as a trauma, not because it's a sexual assault, but because it is a f flip of the classic um, gender dynamic. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a man, a man pursuing a woman, we have a woman pursuing a man, and that is what is so quote-unquote upsetting about it. Yeah. Obviously, that is meaningless. It's rape. Regardless of who is doing it to whom. Yeah. Uh, but Robert Jordan's sort of thesis here seems to be, well, in a world where women have the power, um, like, like Matt says afterwards... This just isn't how it's done. And Tylen says, oh, well, you're in Ebu Dar. So sort of the idea is in Ebu Dar, a place where women have the power over men, not just women channelers having political social power, but yeah. women socially, legally having power over men, then women can do whatever they want to men and get away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so Robert Jordan is sort of in 1999 or whenever this was written doing what 20 years later that lady would do with the book The Power, which is proposed that when women are given power and the patriarchy reverses itself, then women will do the same corrupt, upsetting things to men that men do to women now. Yeah. Um, and I think we've talked already about how that's a 
pretty silly little it, thesis yeah, it's statement. It's just so empty. Like, there's no critical thinking. There's no actual understanding of people. People or power dynamics. Yeah, or, or power social dynamics. dynamics. Or just, like, anything. Yeah. It's just completely empty, as far as my opinion is. Yeah, there's nothing there really worth talking about. It's just bullshit. Yeah, it's just, it really is just bullshit. Like, Tylan is a bullshit character. Every quote-unquote argument she Robert Jordan is trying to make with her is bullshit. She's bullshit. This plot is bullshit. I, ha- I hate it. I hate it. Um. Um, it's also very, just like... One quick comment about the Wheel of Time community's response to this, and then I never want to talk about it again. No, let's do it. Um, for some reason, it apparently is an argument as to whether or not Matt is raped in these chapters. It isn't. But the community, the fans of this series, have really latched on to these few lines about Matt being like, oh, it would be fine if it was reversed, you know, like, this just isn't how it's done. I'm so upset because I'm not the one doing the chasing. And they've just, like, really latched onto this as an excuse for the way that Matt is very obviously responding as someone who has been violated and traumatized. Yeah, you don't ever get to judge a rape victim by what they say immediately after being raped. Yeah, also, I... Like, I think it was a poor choice on Robert Jordan's part to have Matt say something like this. But also, as I will talk about in my notes, if, if we don't get to them this episode, that's fine. Like, people do and say really strange things after they have been traumatized. Trauma is not a neat and tidy thing. Like, the woman in the presentation I watched um, was talking about how one of the survivors of assault that she'd met who'd been, like, the most, like, one of the more brutal instances she'd seen in the hospital immediately after was just, like, laughing hysterically. Like, everything was so funny to her. And it's just, like, the brain is doing things to protect itself. Um, And so Matt trying to, like, rationalize that maybe something bad didn't happen to him, it's just, like, not what he's used to is also part of his trauma response, so. Yeah, and it's interesting that the community latches onto that phrase when there is, in the same chapter, Matt has the line, I have never pursued a woman who made it clear that she did not want to be pursued. Yes, and Matt has made it abundantly clear to Tylan that he does not want to pursue be pursued with his words, with his actions, with literally saying no. Yeah. Like, like there is n- not that, just one of those things is fine. Or just the context of him maybe not being enthusiastic is also fine. So, that's all I have to say about it. I'm never talking about it again. I do not acknowledge anybody who claims this isn't rape. So, Yeah, it's a pretty pretty dumb thing to say or to think. Like, get over it. Yeah, fuck. And honestly, if you're that type of person, get fucked. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any sympathy. Yeah. Yeah, just because Robert Jordan was shitty at writing sexual assault doesn't make the act itself any less of an assault. Yeah, and, like, the, I think what you said is so interesting. Like, there's just so much cognitive dissonance around it because there are parts of it that are, like, so gut-wrenching and so, like, well-portrayed. And there are other parts of it that are just, like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's like Robert Jordan himself yeah. didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. Which we have had moments of cognitive dissonance before and will in the future in this series where it just seems like Robert Jordan was like off the rails. (laughs) Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, thematically, I don't know what I'm doing. I just don't know what I'm doing. But like in these two chapters specifically, it is like the guy could not figure out what he was trying to say or do or present with these chapters. Yeah. And like, okay, fine. But then you should have figured it out before you published it. Yeah, it's just, gosh, how many times can we come back to this? The series is too long and it needed to be edited more. Yeah, I always feel bad because when I say that, I feel like we're slamming Harriet, who is one of the very few editors who is like well known as being connected to a work. Yeah, that's true. And so I want to like be like, I don't 
blame Harriet for doing a bad job if it was in fact her who did a bad job. I do not think the wife of the author should ever have been connected to the editing process. Yeah, I agree. And I also, another note I want to add on to that is to say that it needed to be edited more is also to say that Harriet or whoever deserved more time to be able to edit it. I very much do not believe that Tor Books had anything but the most rushed production schedule. Like, get Wheel of Time out the door. We want to make so much money off of this. We don't really ultimately care that much about the final product. Yeah, the quality. And, like, Harriet obviously isn't the only editor. No. Editing is a huge, especially with books these big um, and projects these involved, that that would require, like, a huge team of people. Yeah. And so, no, we're not just, like, saying, Harriet's a shitty editor. I don't know what else she's edited. Perhaps she is no. astounding. But this series is poorly edited, and it shows. Yeah, and it shows. And that, yeah, is the whole thing. Like, the timeline, probably the amount of people... Just overworked, underpaid editors in New York City trying to do their goddamn best with the Wheel of Time. Um, yeah, but it definitely isn't. So apologies if it sounds like we're like, fuck you, Harriet, but that's not the intent. No. Well, that's it for me, hopping off my soapbox. That was a great soapbox. Do you want to talk a little bit about domestic violence? Sure. Give you, um... Okay, um, so... I wanted to do this, I just felt like it was important to add some type of context to this, um, because domestic violence is a very real thing, and not just something that we are talking about on this podcast. Um, so this information comes from a presentation put together by an organization called South Valley Services, which is an organization in, um, Salt Lake County that provides safe shelter advocacy, case management, and prevention services to people, both children and adults, experiencing psychological, emotional, economic, or sexual abuse at home. That's directly from their mission statement. Um, They also have educational resources on their website, such as the Domestic Violence 101 presentation, which um, is where I get this information from. So if you find this helpful, please consider donating to them. I'll put the link to both the presentation and their donation information, excuse me, in the description of this episode. Um, so also want to clarify around the terms domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, to the best of my knowledge, they're pretty much interchangeable. Domestic violence is an older term and intimate partner violence seems to be the newer term in this um, world. I think the intention Again, I'm not versed in this, but I think the intention is to try and get away from the connotations of domestic violence as being something that only happens within the context of a marriage when intimate partner violence can happen in any form of close relationship. Right. Um, But the presentation used the term domestic violence, so I'm going to stick with that just so I don't use intimate partner violence out of context. Well, and domestic violence also covers, like, the umbrella of children being involved, right? Yes, Correct. Um, so what is domestic violence? Domestic violence is a pattern of behavior where any behavior in a relationship is used to gain or maintain power and control over another person. The training called out that there's a difference between abusive relationships, unhealthy relationships, and healthy relationships. Um, so in an unhealthy relationship, maybe you have two people who just aren't communicating well, not resolving conflicts, but in an abusive relationship, One person is dominating over the other, is exerting power and control over the other person in order to maintain that power over them. Um, So domestic violence, you can think of it as purposeful and deliberate behavior in order to gain power and control. There are different types of abuse. Um, This doesn't cover all of them, but big categories are physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, spiritual abuse, and stalking. Um, physical abuse is the most common form that we see, um, depicted. It's also the one that we probably imagine most frequently. That'd be physical assault, any type of hitting, punching, kicking, any unwanted physical contact. Emotional abuse is the psychological component of this. Um, trying to get a very strong mental tie over another person through things like gaslighting and manipulation. Sexual abuse is any unwanted sexual contact between two people. That can be, like, in person, person to person, or also online, including sexual harassment through social media forums, emails, images sent through texts, anything like that. 
Financial abuse is the one that is probably the most common. A survey done through the Allstate Purple Purse program found that over 99% of survivors of domestic violence stated that they had experienced financial abuse at some point, mm-hmm. which, um, if you think about it, makes sense. We live in a very transactional society, and people who have control over money have more power and social status, so it makes sense in the context of an abusive relationship. If one person is able to have access or more control over their finances, they would be able to use that to take advantage of the other person. Gosh, I never thought about that. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, Spiritual abuse um, goes very much back to power structures. Um, If one person in the relationship through their religious community or culture is able to, (coughs) bless you, abuse some of those systems and use it as a justification for that abuse, that can be really common. Um, Used as a tactic to keep survivors from leaving the relationship. Um, The training mentioned that a lot of people will say the first person they reached out to was one of their religious leaders, and the leaders would tell them that it is against the rules of their faith or against the guidelines of their faith to leave that relationship, saying things like divorce is a sin. Um, And these conversations also happen around children and the idea of, quote unquote, keeping the family together. And finally, stalking. Uh, The training just emphasized that this is extremely concerning. It's often taken for granted and not necessarily considered one of the more dangerous aspects, but research shows that there's a very strong link between stalking behaviors and lethality and homicide. Um, So stalking should be taken very seriously, and if you or someone you know is experiencing stalking or concerned about it, do not take that lightly and try and get in contact with some resources. This can look like a lot of things, but common is sending multiple texts, like 50 texts from someone in 30 minutes or 100 phone calls in an hour, just like that really high frequency. Also includes location tracking, following someone from home to work, constantly checking in on them, calling their workplace, calling their friends, etc., etc. Um, Stalking is extremely scary because our legal system has yet to catch up to the reality that it's a very dangerous crime. Yes. Absolutely. You'll hear in tons of stories that the cop, I mean, the cops are a bad example of any sort of competent law enforcement, but the cops don't take stalking seriously. But yeah, studies show that stalking leads to murder. Yeah. Very scary. So take it super seriously. Yes. Um, Just a few more quick things. Um, Domestic violence does not discriminate anyone of any rage, ace, sexual orientation, religion, or gender can be a victim or a perpetrator of domestic violence. It can happen to people who are married, living together, or dating, and it affects people of all socioeconomic backgrounds and education levels. Um, But while saying anyone can be impacted, there are definitely factors that put someone at more risk um, to be considered a vulnerable population. Um, And those factors are generally what you'd think. People who are experiencing homelessness experience violence at a much higher rate than other populations. Um, Women of color are another one that are particularly at risk to experience violence in a relationship and also experience sexual assault. Um, Okay, the last few things. I'll skip this middle part because I don't know if it's as relevant. Um, I just wanted to call a few barriers to leaving. Um, An interesting thing that the presentation said is that they actually don't like to spend a lot of time on this because it centers why didn't the victim leave rather than why did the perpetrator do this act of violence. Um, And it's more important to try and figure out why that's happening so they can dismantle the violence from that side of it rather than trying to blame the survivors and the victims, which might happen inadvertently if you're focusing on why they didn't leave. But sometimes it's helpful for people to understand that it's not as simple as just walking away, which I feel like might be particularly relevant to Matt's plotline. So here are a few of the most common ones. Um, Guilt and shame, not wanting to start over. The unknown is scarier than the known situation. There's no support system. Victim shaming and blaming, cough, cough, Elaine. Um, If you have history as a couple together, the survivor having low self-esteem, likely as a result of that abusive relationship, the commitment to the relationship, again, particularly if you live in a community that values families and keeping families together. Um, This organization is obviously based in Utah, and we see a lot of rates of domestic violence um, in a very religious community that values keeping families together. Um, Oftentimes, survivors will not be aware that it's okay to leave, based on the history of domestic violence in their family, even before they were in an intimate relationship themselves. 
the current situation is familiar. There are children in the in the situation, financial burden, loneliness, not identifying what's happening as abusive, and finally just a lack of services, a lack of access to services due to geographical barriers, language barriers, immigration barriers. Um, generally in the presentation, they said there's just not enough access to services for every single person experiencing domestic violence to be able to access a safe situation. So um, how can you help? Um, the first step is to educate yourself and recognize the signs of domestic violence. The presentation showed um, something called a power and control wheel, which just has like common examples of domestic violence. So I'll post a link to that image in the description as well if you want to take a look at it. And then finally, I'll also post these resources, but just want to say um, here are a few hotlines. The National Domestic Violence Hotline, you can call at 1-899-799-3224. Or if calling is not safe, you can text them by texting START, S-T-A-R-T, to 88788. Also, loveisrespect.org has lots of different options, including a chat feature directly on the website, texting and calling options. And finally, the most important thing you can do if someone is talking to you about this or if you see things like this, respond with empathy and kindness and believe the survivor if they are saying that they are experiencing abuse. Um, validate them if they happen to say things like, oh, I wouldn't have been hit if I had done X, Y, Z, or if I hadn't, if I had done this or I hadn't done that, tell them that they'd never, ever deserve to be abused. So, sorry, that was a little bit longer probably than no, my was, allotted six or great. seven minutes. Thank you. But, yes. Um, also, in terms of resources, today I was racking my brains trying to think of any other texts that deal with the specific situation of women assaulting men, hmm. which is a a pretty uh, rare circumstance in literature. Uh, it's also statistically one of the less reported crimes. Yes. That obviously does not mean it isn't happening, but it is happening at slightly lower rates than men assaulting women, men assaulting men, etc. Yeah. Um, but uh, the only one I could think of really was a book called The Kingdoms by Natasha Poli. It's very different than The Wheel of Time, and uh, it's not, that isn't really the main component of the story, but it does deal with it in, I think, an interesting way. Um, if generally you're looking for any texts about sexual assault specifically that um, are good and nuanced and healing, I recommend Deer Skin by Robin McKinley. Um, that's one of my favorite, but if you, um, but we'll post any more that we think of between now and uh, posting. Um, that's it. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry for a, a. Yeah, sorry for a weird episode. One last quick thing. The presentation also talked about how, like, actual, like, media is really harmful. Like, the mm -hmm. more you see domestic violence portrayed the more like normalized it becomes and that's not to say that it cannot be done well like deer skin i haven't read it but emily has talked to me about it and it seems like it's handling a difficult situation in a way that is very nuanced and adds a lot of like carries a lot of empathy and kindness when dealing with a really difficult thing it's texts like Wheel of Time, to an extent, and texts like Game of Thrones, um, that I think this is especially prevalent in fantasy when it's like, oh, it was a different time. Hitting mm -hmm. women was okay. Yeah. Whereas if, like, that's not true, it's never been okay. Um, it was just more normalized. And also, like, you get to pick what the culture of your fantasy book looks like. Um, so domestic and intimate partner violence does not need to be a big part of it just because you fucking suck and don't want to do the work to create a more interesting fantasy world. <clears throat> Robert. <laughs> uh, well, well, on that cheery note, uh, in all seriousness, thanks for listening. Yeah. Um, for sticking with us if you listen to this entire episode. Thanks to Glenna McKenzie for our theme song. Uh, thanks to our patrons on Patreon. Uh, if you are on Patreon, a couple links to be looking out for. 
uh, Sally just finished Winter's Heart, so the week that, uh, when you're listening to this, last week was a break, but I'm going to be starting this week with um, a few blogs on uh, not Wheel of Time, just any fantasy texts, long-form fantasy texts that I've read in the last couple of years that I want to talk about. Uh, that won't be for long before Sally comes back with Crossroads of Twilight, oh, but Jesus Christ. yeah, <laughs> wanted to give her a little <laughs> break before carrying on. Um, do you want to talk about stickers? Yes. Um, so we, if you've been with a podcast for a long time, a couple years ago did a run of stickers. We had some really great artists design EHR related designs for three stickers. Um, and they're really lovely and a lot of people bought them, but partially it was me just buying too many stickers because it was cheaper. Um... But we still have a lot of them, which we would uh, like to get rid of just for space reasons. Um, and we would like to get rid of them by giving them to you. So the patrons, the patrons. Sorry, <laughs> you. The rest of you suckers. Yeah, the rest of you can not get stickers. Boo. <laughs> um. So what we are going to do is run. Patreon calls them special promotions, so I'll call them that. A special promotion where if you sign up at um the one dollar level. We'll probably start it next week and run it for like a month or something. If you start up at the at the one dollar level, we'll send you the one dollar level. We'll send you one sticker. If you sign up at the three dollar level, we'll send you all three designs. Um, no extra charge. It'll be just be part part of your Patreon benefit. And if you are already a one dollar or three dollar patron who hasn't bought stickers in the past and would like to get them again free of charge, already as part of your um, Patreon support, just send us a message, um, include your address and we'll get those sent out to you. Obviously this is, um, while supplies last. And if you opt for just one sticker, um, I'll post the designs again. You can give us your first choice, um, but I uh, can't guarantee that we'll get them to you just based on supply. Um, and if you are concerned, part of this whole thing was making sure that the artist got paid a portion of the sticker and we will, pay them out for whatever the portion of their earnings would be. So the artists are still going to get their full money off of this promotion. We just want to move the stock, so to speak. 10-4. Texas size, 10-4. It's a long explanation, I'm sorry. No, I feel you. Um, and that's it from us. That is it. What's that, bro? I think we have said enough. We've said enough. Every every week I'm like, that is enough out of this bitch. That's enough out of me. Time to go watch Naruto. <laughs> um, do you have a sign off? Um, this one is not like funny haha, but like funny America's a nightmare. Oh wait, we could just do the cricket story. Oh my god! Oh my god! I've already like blocked it from my memory. Yeah. <gasps> okay, every night well, this is a little insight into my psychoses. Every night I have to check the garage door and the front door to make sure they are locked or I cannot go to sleep. And it has become this ritual with Tybalt. Yeah. He has... Security check. Yeah, we call it security check. He has adopted that every night after we do his eye drops, we go downstairs. Mm-hmm. And he and I are down there for like a minute. And he's like, this is the ritual. Now we can all go to bed. Yeah. So last night we're going down. Da, 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 da. It's like the light is on on our front porch, but it's like dark in the little entryway. And Tybalt is skittering around like crazy. And I cannot see what he is getting at and so I flick on the light and nothing I don't see, like because sometimes there are spiders down there but like I don't see spiders I don't see like a little piece of lint Tybalt runs upstairs so Emily comes down and I'm like crouched down looking Tybalt like ran past me yeah and I was just like hello yeah and I'm like Emily Tybalt is acting like he sees something and it is like making me insane because I do not see anything and Emily who's like much more calm of a person is like yeah well who knows? Tybalt's a freak. <laughs> so I'm like finishing checking everything. Emily comes upstairs and she shouts down. She's like, oh, it's a cricket. And I was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Tybalt had taken the cricket in his mouth, I guess. I don't know. Or it was riding him oh. like <laughs> into the into the sunset. Like a, like a warrior cat. Who knows? I just walked upstairs and Tybalt was under one of the chairs and there was just a little cricket on the um hardwood and kind of this empty space the same cricket that i'd like seen in the garage the day before 
yeah. And it's just like you see a cricket in the garage and you're like, I huh, hope hey, that cricket. doesn't get in. Yeah. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. I don't know how it did. The garage door has never opened for longer than 30 seconds. But it so did. It, it made its flight to freedom, although it wasn't freedom. It was being terrorized by Tybalt. Yeah. But somehow the cricket survived its ordeal. Ordeal. So we were able to safely release the cricket into the bush outside. The big mystery truly is how the cricket got from the downstairs <laughs> to the upstairs. Yeah, like what How happened? did it, did it cling to Tybalt? Was Tybalt carrying it in his mouth? Who's to say? Who's Tybalt to say? Tybalt was just spooked the rest of the night. Oh yeah, And he Tybalt. kept looking for the cricket. He was like, that was my, that was my buddy <laughs> that I was probably going to kill. That was my buddy that I was trying to eat. <laughs> anyway guys, it was like, because of all the fucking things, how is it a cricket? That Tybalt found. But the cricket, last we saw, was safe in cricket, the bushes. Yeah, cricket so. was in the bushes. It can go tell all its cricket's friends it's, how it... Yeah. So narrowly avoided the jaws of death. Yeah, Tybalt's grimy little mouth. <sighs> Seriously, felt so, whatever, so crazy. No crickets were harmed in the making of this podcast. No. <laughs> <laughs> it should be the title of this. <laughs> That's the only title I can think of. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.